Welcome to this presentation on the Catholic Church. I was raised Catholic and experienced this church from the inside for 35 years. I want to share with you the reasons that I left the Catholic Church. I have three main points. First, I will present compelling evidence that Jesus did not make Peter the first pope, that Christ did not establish the Catholic Church. Then we will look at the Catholic sacraments. If they are valid, then everyone should consider becoming a Catholic. But if they are not valid, then maybe others might want to consider leaving this church. Then we will explore some examples of controversial Catholic teaching. This is a critical scripture for the Catholic Church. The belief is that Jesus commissioned Peter to be the first pope. Jesus said, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The Catholic Church contends this verse commissioned Peter as Pope. But let's see what Peter had to say. Peter wrote, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The cornerstone, the singularly big rock of the church, Peter understood it to be Christ, not himself. But we have more than Peter's testimony in this matter. Paul wrote that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So the foundation of the church are the apostles, to include Peter in that group, and prophets. Paul made no special mention of Peter having a unique status. Peter was simply one of the apostles upon whom the church is built. So where did the Roman Catholic Church originate? The answer is that it started with a Roman emperor, Constantine. This emperor arrived on the scene in the 4th century as Rome was beginning to crumble. Constantine was the first Christian emperor. He legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire and forged an integration of church and state of epic proportions. Constantine built the original St. Peter's Basilica, which lasted until 1506 AD. It stood for over a thousand years. Constantine built this basilica at the place currently known as Vatican City, or the Vatican. Constantine was the one who started the Roman Catholic Church. Another important thing that Constantine did was to split the Roman Empire in half to offset the weakened reach of Rome. He named the capital city of the Eastern Roman Empire after himself, Constantinople, which is modern-day Istanbul, Turkey. The Bishop of Rome held some prominence because of his location in Rome. But there were other bishops that were widely recognized to include the Bishop of Constantinople. This split of the Roman Empire into West and Eastern halves eventually became significant to the Christian world because as time passed, the prominence of Rome continued to grow even after the fall of Rome with the onset of the Holy Roman Empire. The cities where other bishops were located became insignificant by comparison. So Pope Leo IX decided to pull rank on the other bishops resulting in an event called the Great Schism of 1064 AD. This was a petty fight for authority within the church. Pope Leo called for all the churches in his realm to start using Latin. You see, some churches were using Greek, the language of the New Testament. It was, use the holy language of Rome or be shut down. The Patriarch of Constantinople retaliated by shutting down any church that used Latin within his realm. The Roman Church by this point stretched all the way from Spain to Germany, even Poland. 
the Eastern Orthodox churches govern less influential areas like Greece, Turkey, and Egypt. With this enhanced stature, the Pope called all other forms of Christianity invalid, that the only true church was the Roman Catholic Church, and a millennium later, that claim is still being made. Here is a new take on a familiar scripture. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. You might say that Caesar Augustus was dual-hatted. He was the emperor and the pontifex maximus. In other words, Caesar Augustus was the pope. In fact, the title pontifex maximus or pope had been established hundreds of years before Christ. For century, it had been the title used by the head of religion for the Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor Tiberius Caesar Augustus was Pontifex Maximus during the time of Christ's ministry. When Christ ascended to heaven at the end of his earthly ministry, Tiberius was the Pope. Tiberius was in charge of religion for the Roman Empire, not Peter. Yet popes throughout the centuries have proudly claimed this pagan title. Here's an example. Pope Clemens XII commissioned Trevi Fountain to be built in Rome. The inscription crediting Pope Clemens used his formal title, Pontifex Maximus. Take a look at the bottom line. That is, in the year of our Lord, 1735, the Pontiff. The title Pope is nowhere to be seen. Now about our second point, the Catholic sacraments. There are seven sacraments in the Catholic Church. We are going to focus on two of them, baptism and the Eucharist, also known as Holy Communion. This is what the Catholic Catechism, which is official doctrine, teaches about baptism. Baptism is birth into the new life in Christ in accordance with the Lord's will. It is necessary for salvation as is the church herself, which we enter by baptism. First, I need to clarify that the number 1277 is the line number of the statement in the catechism, not a year. This statement says that baptism is necessary for salvation, as is being a member of the Catholic Church. But not to worry, Catholic baptism makes you a member of the Catholic Church. So both baptism and church membership are necessary for salvation. Now, this is what the older generation was taught, but it is not necessarily what is being taught today. Today's Catholic Church is more inclusive. Just a few lines down from this hard line statement about baptism, church membership, and salvation, this catechism states, all those who seek God sincerely and strive to fulfill his will, are saved, even if they have not been baptized. It is amazing that these contradictory statements are presented essentially one right after the other, like right next to each other, and no one is calling them out. When I was young, Catholics used to be kidded that they did not know the Bible very well. But from our perspective, that was okay because we knew our catechism, which for us was the only correct interpretation of the Bible. Today, a lot of Catholic churches do a better job of teaching the Bible. This is normally the case where there is a good Bible teaching church just down the road. But Catholics attending these churches tend to not know Catholic doctrine as well. They are not so much aware of what is being taught in other Catholic churches. Now I need to introduce a book. According to the description of its current edition on Amazon, this book was first published in 1967 and has become America's most popular guide to modern Catholicism. And, and that is true. Years ago, when I volunteered to teach high school catechism classes, I studied this book and the Bible to make sure I was teaching correctly. That study led me out of the Catholic Church. 
This book addresses the salvation of those not baptized, starting with the second paragraph, an adult who believes in God and, basically, desires to do his will and who has sorrow for his sins out of love for God has God's grace presence by this sincere desire. His sins would be forgiven. Then dropping down to the next paragraph, people come to God in this way through other non-Christian religions. When stating that those not baptized can be saved, the contemporary Catholic Church put no limits on who all could be saved, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, even atheists. And that is the point of these articles. The first one is titled, Pope Francis's Outreach to Atheists, Not as Controversial as It Seems. Reading from the highlighted material in the red box, Pope Francis assures atheists, you don't have to believe in God to go to heaven. The next article describes how the Jesuits, a leading order within the Catholic Church, have determined that God speaks through a multitude of religions. Again, reading from the highlighted material, the idea that God's word passed through the mouths of others, Muhammad's for instance, or through the sacred texts of other religions outside the Judeo-Christian sphere was unthinkable until now. Moving on to the most important sacrament, the one at the center of the Catholic Mass. The Eucharist, which is also called Holy Communion, is based on transubstantiation. That is, that the bread and wine become the literal body and blood of Christ during the Mass. The Council of Trent stated about the Eucharist that a change is brought about of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. At no point has this doctrine been struck down or modified. Now, as some Catholics have become skeptical, many perceive that no change actually occurs to the bread and wine. So now Catholics who question the veracity of Holy Communion are often told that it is the real presence of Christ that is in their communion bread, as opposed to the transformation of the bread into the literal body of Christ. It is kind of like, trust me, Christ is present within the communion bread. There would be no value in transforming communion bread into Christ. Scripture tells us that the real presence of God, the Holy Spirit, already resides in all believers. This question is taken from scripture. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you, not in your communion bread? This page, I remember reading it the first time. This page was a point where I knew that I was going to leave the Catholic Church. Reading the highlighted material, in the first paragraph, it says, the bread and wine are now Christ. But you skip down just a few lines, and the author is writing, we are not saying that the bread and wine are Christ. What a tremendous contradiction. Now let's look at examples of controversial Catholic teaching, starting with the Ten Commandments. Here are the Ten Commandments as they appear in the Bible. We will focus on the second commandment, which forbids idols, forbids idolatry. This is the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Because Catholic churches have statues and crucifixes, this commandment was problematic. To get around the situation, the church tweaked the teaching of the Ten Commandments. They got rid of the second commandment, but when they got to the last commandment, they were only at number nine. So they split the ninth commandment into two commandments. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. The rosary is a series of prayers to the Virgin Mary. 
the main part of the rosary is a repetition of ten Hail Marys for each Our Father. Each segment of ten Hail Marys has a special dedication. The last dedication is Mary is gloriously crowned Queen of Heaven and Earth. There was a Queen of Heaven in the Old Testament. Here's a description of those honoring that Queen of Heaven. The children gathered wood, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cakes to offer to the Queen of Heaven. But what is most interesting is God's reaction to honoring the Queen of Heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to arouse my anger. I obtained a right relationship with God once I understood the meaning of these two scriptures. These scriptures are spoken during the Mass at the moment of the, the supposed transformation of the bread and of the wine. The priest would hold up a communion wafer and say, Take and eat, this is my body. But later on, Paul wrote that we are members of his body. At the Last Supper, Christ was calling all believers to be a part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ consists of believers worldwide, not communion wafers. Another feature of this new covenant pertains to the blood of Christ. Also at the Last Supper, Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant. And later it was written in scripture that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The words of the new covenant were stated at the Last Supper. That covenant was then sealed with the blood of Christ on the cross. I now place my faith in a personal covenant relationship that God offers, a covenant that provides forgiveness and peace. If you agree or disagree, I welcome your comments. Subscribing to this YouTube channel helps increase the rankings of this video in search results. Thank you for listening.